My name is Madhavan. I work with an organization called Chirag. We work in the uh, Kumau region of Uttarakhand and we work in roughly 200 villages in that area. So you were just telling us about uh, the, the water crisis that you're seeing there. And one of the points you made was that because of the peculiar situation there that you'll have to do valley to valley work rather than a traditional what's called the rich to valley. What we've learned over the last three years and we now feel that, that needs to be scaled up is that we feel that ultimately if we want to recharge springs then and we want the best way to do it is based on principles of hydrogeology. And if we start to take the geology, hydrogeology into account, we've discovered that very often your springs could lie on one side of a ridge, whereas the recharge zone could be on the other side of the ridge. And therefore, if you actually want to recharge springs in a sustainable manner, your approach actually has to be from valley to valley, rather than the traditional watershed approach of ridge down to valley. Uh, that's basically what we've discovered in the last three years. So you've spent a lot of time doing the, the spring recharge works, so you'll feel that it's bearing fruit that We've, you know, we've, we've started, we started with 30 springs because we wanted to start small and based on the evidence then go ahead because we were starting based on assumptions and spring recharge of this kind has never been attempted on such a scale, even 30 springs have never been attempted in the Kumau region or in Uttarakhand. And so we wanted to start small, we started to see some preliminary evidence now in the last two years and now based on that feel that this needs to be scaled up uh, across the state uh, and across mountainous areas in other parts of the country. And you're also making the, the other point that this is expensive work, so how does one try to make a decision on, on whether it's spring yeah. as a source I, of water? Is yeah, I think the problem is that because we have scattered populations and low population density in the mountains, if you look at the investment per spring, it turns out to be very expensive. However, if you then look at an integrated natural resource management approach where you're working from valley to valley, rather than from spring to, from ridge to valley, and you're also looking at sustainable agriculture, looking at community forestry, looking at fodder access, as well as water, all in the same area, then your investment or your, your returns on your investment are much more. So it's not just water increase, but you're also looking at improvements in agriculture, access, better access to fodder. So I think you need to look at that in a holistic manner for the, for the investment we justify. And uh, the interesting point you're making about uh, uh, the, the biological contamination of the water possibly being from manure and also that, that the toilet construction itself may be a problem because... You know, one of the problems we have is that we're seeing very, you know, almost 75% of the springs that we're tracking now, we're starting to see contamination, uh, fecal contamination. We're not able to, there are no simple tests that are allowing us to segregate uh, the, the source of contamination. So we don't know whether the contamination is because of human excreta or because of manure. Now E. coli could uh, exist in both. Now, that is one problem. The other is that given our understanding of how subsurface drainage and subsurface water flows operate in the mountains, we've also discovered that your recharge zone, if the, between your recharge zone and your spring, if you have habitations which have latrines, it is possible that some of the subsurface drainage is actually passing through the septic tanks. So you could actually have live sources of contamination. But when we actually constructed these latrines, we did not take this into account. So we now have to question design of latrines also, given the possibility that these might then become sources of contamination. Have you, I'm sure you've heard of these eco things. Uh, we've looked at the eco things. We need to look at how we can adapt it to be able to use them in the mountains. We haven't yet done any work on it. So uh, open defecation might actually have been better in this case, you're saying, because you it's not, not going down. Decentralize the contamination. Uh -huh. A septic tank is a... <laughs> has actually led to consolidation of all the contamination. Uh, you have been working with Aquadam to understand the groundwater. So any uh, sort of, I, I'm sure you learned a lot, but anything that you can some crystallize that into, you know, what do you all understand about the groundwater there that, that can easily be communicated? Without Aquadam, we had not looked at the mountains as having aquifers. So Aquadam allowed us in our minds to start to recognize the existence of aquifers in the mountains and to also recognize that springs are basically points where water is being discharged from the aquifer. I think that was the most significant contribution of Aquadam's uh, training and skill building to us. What has also happened is our natural resource management team now for every spring creates a geological map, uh, identifies the recharge zone for each spring. 
In the process, we have also discovered that trainings from Aquadam have made it possible for colleagues of mine who studied up to 10 standard, 12 standard, to be able to map, uh, you know, to create geological maps, to recognize rock formations. So in that sense, it has also proved that in some sense, basic geology, hydrogeology is a skill can get, that can be trans transmitted. So you could have a whole cadre of barefoot geologists uh, created by Aquadam. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks.